Good morning and welcome to the 2022 Intel Power Minority Business Conference. My name is Andrea Neely and I'm the President and CEO of the Simon Youth Foundation, which in 1998 the foundation was launched to support the community by ensuring that students graduate from high school. This evening or this morning we have two amazing superintendents. With us we have Sean Smith who's representing mm -hmm. the Lawrence Township um, school district as well as Dr. Alicia Johnson who's representing IPS. Our conversation today will discuss about the impact of COVID 2020 and the lessons learned and the growth that we've had to be able to address the needs of our community, our teachers, and our students. Welcome this morning. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for all the work that you both are doing to ensure that our students get to and through high school and mm -hmm. into the next journey of life. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about, and either one of you can share, um, what's been the impact that COVID has had within your, your school districts? Well, I'll start and thank you again for the invitation to be a part of this conversation with my esteemed colleague here. Mm -hmm. um, all of us are really leading in incredible work and I think we've all experienced lots of challenges over the past uh, three years, two and a half years. I think in the education space specifically, COVID it turned our worlds upside down just like it did for everyone else. Um, but I think what what I saw happen in IPS across with districts across our, our state and our country, our schools really step up and say, um, this is how we are going to continue to ensure our students are educated and to meet some of those community needs. Our schools are places, yes, where students are learning how to read and to write, to do math, but they are also places where we are feeding our students to make sure they have proper nutrition, where we are addressing their mental health needs, addressing their social and emotional needs, and the, that was work that we had to continue to do and, in fact, prioritize during a time of a lot of uncertainty and instability. Um, so I think you know, we were able to do that by focusing on keeping our students and staff safe, making sure those primary needs were met, and then ensuring we were flexible enough to address the learning needs our students had as well. And you're coming from the, the largest um, school district, um, you know, for the state of Indiana, and I know that was a, a greater challenge. But, you know, in addition to, uh, again, what's happening in the Lawrence Township as well. Right, very similar to what Dr. Johnson said. I, I just want people to understand, you cannot close school. You know, when we went through the pandemic, we shut school down completely and not allow for our kids to come in was extremely difficult, specifically to the African-American community, mm -hmm. because these youngsters, their families, everything about our community is centered around the school. The school's in the middle of the community. It serves, like you said, we feed them, we educate them, uh, we have athletic events, performing arts, everything about a community is evolved around its school. So when youngsters are not able to have that, it impacts them developmentally, mm -hmm. the social emotional needs that they have, their friends, the community at large is impacted negatively. So we don't wanna go back down that road. But on the other side, we found a way to feed them, provide virtual education, do everything that we can to support them, and it's really refreshing to have school back open. And, and that's so important to be able to engage families um, within the pivot. But mm -hmm. let, let's talk about something that I think um, many, um, you know, experienced and saw, the, the impact that the pandemic had on our, on our teachers. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to how, one, your um, various uh, school districts supported mm -hmm. your teachers, um, you know, through this process? Well, I think first and foremost, you, you got to know the heart and mind of teachers. They want to be with their students. So emotionally, not being able to interact with my kids and teach them live was challenging. Mask over the face, you're teaching young people how to read. Mm -hmm. As an elementary teacher, that's very challenging. So that psyche of teachers was certainly impacted by the pandemic. And then their own personal side, you know, if you are middle aged or older, you got a family member who could be sick or you got your own children. Uh, being quarantined and not being able to interact with your students certainly put a great burden on the back of teachers and then the community demand for them. We need our schools open. You need to be there. Uh, really created a very stressful time for our educators and, and at the end of the day we realize how important they are to our community and our in particular schools. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean I would just say if you imagine March 2020 when we made that announcement there's something happening in our community. Right and we need to all sort of go home because right. we don't know how to manage this. We thought, okay, a couple of weeks probably, yeah. you know, let's get mm -hmm. spring break, after spring break we'll be back in school. And then the announcement comes, you know, you're not coming back. So we literally had to, in our schools, figure out how do we make this pivot to take everything that happens in a classroom and all of a sudden put it into a virtual context. Our teachers had to carry that load mm -hmm. of how do I yes. take teaching reading 
mm -hmm. in person and try to translate that to a virtual environment, usually in a time where I've not been trained how to do that. And by the way, I'm expected to do that in a matter of days or weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a tremendous load to carry, but I think it just speaks to the resiliency, the flexibility, um, the professionalism that our mm -hmm. teachers bring to the classroom every day, um, which is why they should be you know, highly respected right. for, for the work that they do. Absolutely. So that really speaks to um, the unique talent that they probably learned that they had but didn't necessarily use. So when you had to pivot and go more into the technology space, um, how, was, how were they able to kind of navigate that to make sure um, the kids were online and being able to, to, to really complete their, their mm -hmm. lessons? I think w the way we approached it was both the, te the technical aspects as well as the adaptive. So mm -hmm. technically, how are we giving our teachers PD on, how do you manage Microsoft Teams? That was the platform <laughs> we used. Um, how might you use our Schoology platform, mm -hmm. for example, more than you may have used it when we were in person? Um, how do you use you know, the, that Google or Apple, the iPad that students have? How do you know how to tell a student how to navigate that? So there's lots of technical skills that our teachers had to all of a sudden sort of put into their toolbox. And then adaptively, back to the, how do I translate this part of my lesson into a, a virtual environment? You know, how do I connect with my mm -hmm. students and build a relationship through a screen, especially when we're all experiencing this high level of anxiety or worry or uncertainty? So we also try to provide professional development just around how do you how do you build relationship in this new context? Um, how might we be checking in with our students in ways that we didn't before? Um, and then some work with teachers on how are you how do you take care of yourself in the midst of this time where it feels like I just have no idea what's going to happen next. And certainly teachers weren't the only ones experiencing. We were experiencing mm -hmm. that as superintendents Absolutely. along with the rest of our community. Right. We weren't immune from that that level of. Right. anxiety and uncertainty. And, right. and, and I applaud um, the teachers, the parents. I think we all um, grew from mm -hmm. the pandemic and we've learned a lot about our ability to, to pivot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there is some, some impact um, based that um, on the pandemic that's had on not only our teachers, um, not only the families, but more importantly, the impact of our students. Um, mm -hmm. You know, data's gonna come and, and show how proficient are our students. Mm -hmm. Um, how, how do you begin to talk and, and address that well? As, as I well? think you have to look at it just purely from very simply, kids learn when they're engaged and when they're in school. You take that away from them, you're going to have learning loss. Uh, I'm a former classroom teacher and I could watch kids grow and develop through the school year by their attendance and their interaction and their engagement. And when you, like you said, Alicia, when we marched to what up, was 10th or 11th of 2020, when we stopped, kids lost that. Uh, some kids got lost in the mist. And as a res but because the school becomes such a powerful tool, it's the center for them. They come every day, they're supported. And when that goes away, kids lose something. So learning loss is at the top of the list of what we're trying to do in Lawrence Township. We are all in to support our kids. We, we're doing our Jumpstart Summer School, our extended programming, we've got tutoring we're doing to try to help young people to get caught back up, especially at the lower grade levels. My, my babies, I'm worried about them. You know, when you miss a year and a half of school, live instruction, developmentally, that's not good. And in particular for kids who are in poverty, it's even worse. So how do we give those kids more? That's what we're trying to figure out now. And, and that's speaking to the data that's showing that um, students of color, there there's a, a significant decline mm -hmm. uh, in their performance and proficiencies. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so um, what are some of the uh, alternative um, opportunities that you have within your district to, mm -hmm. to address what you know is, is, is very, um, you know, prevalent within lower income students of colors and family about addressing mm -hmm. um, the, the gap? Sure, and we know that's not new. COVID didn't oh. create it, it just exacerbated. I know we all exactly. live that life every mm -hmm. single day. And I think the power though is we are able to have these conversations, in my opinion, more explicitly to get at why is it that we see these outcomes sort of mm -hmm. reproducing themselves time and time again mm -hmm. and what do we need to do differently? I think some of that again is the adaptive mindset work of if you see a particular subgroup of students performing you know, at the bottom time after time after time, there's nothing inherently wrong with our black children. No. We know that. No. <laughs> so that does, should not have to be said, but let's say it to be no. clear. So that means that what we are doing in our systems, in our schools, in our communities, right, need to make sure that we are, we are adjusting ourselves to meet uh, the needs that they have so that they can achieve, because there's nothing mm -hmm. inherently wrong with them. So, so we need to do something a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I think what COVID has demonstrated is 
we as a system, as a community, as a city, as a state, can be flexible if we choose to. Mm -hmm. We can put the resources where they belong if we choose to. We can make the investment if we choose to. We can do things like, for example, in Indianapolis Public Schools, you know, additional tutoring at particular schools, and we are doubling down on those efforts to support mm -hmm. specific students who we know um, aren't achieving yet at the levels we want them to. We are doubling down on professional development for our teachers, for example, on the science of reading. So how do you really teach reading effectively to address mm -hmm. uh, those needs that we've seen with our, with our mm -hmm. lower learners. With our high school students, we are talking about, you know, what's, what's the value add for our high schoolers to really stay engaged and invested in high school? How do we help bridge their high school experience to what they're going to go do post-secondary, whether that's employment and straight to the workforce, what are those skills, the employability skills they need, whether that's enrollment uh, in a two or four year university, whether that's going into the military, we need to be sure what they're doing during that four years of high school is keeping them highly engaged and on the track to have the life they want to have. And so I think that that's the conversation we're having more of and we're talking a lot more about how, are, how do our systems and structures support certainly all of our students, but particularly our black and brown students who we know over time um, the needs have not been met the way they should be. And, and that just brings me to a, a question of um, when students see someone that looks like them, mm -hmm. they're motivated even more so. Mm -hmm. um, and so let's talk about um, how do our teachers, uh, again, diversity in our classroom, how is that impacted by COVID and, and what are some of the lessons learned and opportunities to grow um, talent um, of, of diversity for our schools? Well, I, I think we had a problem with that before the pandemic. Yes, I mean, let's right. just be honest. Uh, hiring of African-American and Hispanic teachers is a great challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you, the pool is just simply not there. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we've had a downturn just with teachers, period, because a lot of negativity. First and foremost, we must honor teachers. Yes. They are noble people, highly important to a community, should be respected and honored at the highest level. When you commit your entire life, I'm on 32 years, to doing what we do, you got to have something in her that's quite special. And what comes of that are many kids who I have supported, I have promoted, su helped become teachers, administrators, whatever they want to be. And that's what we have to commit ourselves to because we need people in the classroom that look like the kids, mm -hmm. who are part of the community and understand what the kids need. So um, investing in better futures has mm -hmm. a, a meaning that speaks to teachers mm -hmm. and students and investing in families and communities. So if, if you had a wish list um, mm -hmm. that you could get support from, you know, your municipalities, the Indiana Department of Education, what would be on that wish list that you would love for them to, to do? If I could wave my magic wand. I, I think we have support, but I, I want to go back to what Dr. Johnson pointed out about early childhood education. That is the game changer in the African American community. Mm -hmm. That's where the achievement gap starts. Healthy, strong, suburban kids, preschool education, early childhood education is a standard. It's not even discussed. It just happens. We just assume that it happens in poorer communities and it does not. Mm -hmm. And so when a youngster shows up to kindergarten, first grade, well, first of all, in Indiana, kindergarten is not mandatory. Let's just talk about that. It isn't mandatory. Mm -hmm. So then we get into the achievement gap and we bring poverty, the fact that youngsters don't show up, and then we see this gap, and then we ask ourselves a question, what are we going to do about it? There it is. It's right in front of us. So why don't we just take this investment that we have in our country, all of us a little bit, and put it into our young people. Give them the tools they need to get started early, and you will see dip pay dividends on the back end as youngsters will be brighter, more well-educated, because we have to remediate. When we talk about African American students not achieving, we work with them over time. And those students turn out to be great young people mm -hmm. over time. But they're behind because more African Americans are poor. Let's just talk facts. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do that at my age. I'm just going to tell the truth. They're poor. So how do we bridge that gap? Mm -hmm. Let's take away those excuses. Let's take away all of those things and put our investment in helping those kids at the front end. I would love to see every child that's in my community show up for preschool education three and four. And then I want them back for kindergarten. That's it. Mandatory, all of them. And then watch what will happen over the next 12 years for those youngsters. So as I retire, when I retire in the next 10 years, I want to see that happen. Yeah. I so. think that's a vision we can get behind. I think, I would, you know, mm -hmm. I think as a community, we sort of have disparate 
places where we're mm -hmm. focusing. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for us to all, you know, coalesce around mm -hmm. early learning, for example, mm -hmm. coalesce around reading and literacy. If my, if my students I know are coming to me uh, able to read their letters, mm -hmm. recognize their letters um, at kinder, we're already on a whole different <laughs> path and trajectory for success for that student as they go through K through 12. So I, I think that there's a lot mm -hmm. of work we can do in that space. And then I think to Sean's point around the impacts of poverty, I also think we have to um, sort of more broadly think about the investment in neighborhoods that we know have been have been disinvested. Like we've, we've not made investment. And so yes, I can ensure your baby is going to know how to read and I can ensure when they're in my building, they're going to eat a healthy meal. What I cannot ensure and need support on is that they have a home that will be stable for the course of the school mm -hmm. year, that um, their mother isn't going to have to worry mm -hmm. about back and forth mm -hmm. between um, job stability and the ability mm -hmm. to have the additional resources she needs to actually have um, her job because she childcare and pre-K is not mm -hmm. there. So now I'm having to choose between my job, but my kid, right. I got to take care of my baby. And we ask people to make these these choices mm -hmm. when they don't have resources that we don't we don't we wouldn't accept for right. other groups of people. Right. We wouldn't say it's okay. And so we, but we put certain groups of people in these circumstances, we don't make the investment and then we wonder why we don't see achievement. Mm -hmm. And we don't see achievement and we see um, an increase of dropout rates. Mm -hmm. And so as, as we look at investing in the resources, um, we also have to uh, address the, the impact that the pandemic has had within these families that have so many obstacles and barriers um, what happens to those students? And I think we, we all know um, the word is alternative schools. Yes. And so um, it's so important to the work that the Simon Youth Foundation does in, in partnership with both of you because we mm -hmm. both have uh, academies mm -hmm. with, uh, with IPS and, and Lawrence because there's some amazing students who are dealing with situations and scenarios within their household that prevents them, one, from getting to school. Uh, if parents have uh, addictions or, or, or employment issues and the students are moving in their transitional mm -hmm. um, through different um, school districts, they're losing out too. And so I'm looking to understand, you know, how do we begin to anticipate and address the number of students that we should be seeing that have a need for alternative, and alternative is to ensure that students who have gone through the pandemic, who are tracking to, to graduate, now have, have lost some of the steam to complete, um, have a place and, and an opportunity to finish so they can continue um, you know, what is destined for them. If it's college, if it's going into sure. um, you know, credentialing in the workforce, um, what's the important role in which um, such uh, alternative schools are supporting and assisting students who are coming out of the pandemic uh, to complete their, their high school education and move on to post-secondary or employment? Profound. Um, I know the history of the Simon U Foundation, and I'm getting old, Andrea. I remember <laughs> when they started, and, and I worked in another district, and now we're, we're back partnering because it is a game changer. Uh, what we're talking about is on the back end making an investment in young people who don't have the support. And here we have a great organization like the Simon Youth Foundation. I don't think people understand it. Profound. Because you're looking at a 3, 4, 5% increase in our graduation rate with the support from an organization like yours who is bringing in resources and opportunities for young people who typically don't fit in a traditional high school setting. So it fits perfectly with what we're trying to do because I think today all of our high schools want to keep all of our students. We want them to graduate. We want to help them overcome those barriers because those barriers are real. Uh, pregnancy, teen pregnancy, the fact that their parents uh, put them out of the house, social issues that prevent them from making it through high school and here we have this great organization that says here, here are all these resources and support for you school to help these young people get a high school diploma and maybe even go to college and it can be done. So I think it's a tremendous uh, opportunity for us and I know Simon has been with us. Uh, we have a great alternative program but we partner with you guys because you do it all over the nation. Mm -hmm. And it is having an impact, not just in the Indianapolis area, but from coast to coast. And so we wanted to be a part of that, that revolution, to make sure that every kid gets, earns a high school diploma. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we're in this conversation and speaking with you because we partner with Simon yeah. Youth, which I believe represents the fact that we understand one size does not fit all. Absolutely. And we need to have those different pathways and flexibilities mm -hmm. for our students, meet them where they are so they mm -hmm. can be successful. So I know as I've 
walked SYA before in the mall mm -hmm. and seen, you know, the photography, for example, exhibits our students have mm -hmm. done. I know our student council at SYA, they've hosted blood drives mm -hmm. and their student council has taken a really prominent leadership role within the district and um, gone on the DC trip with the other schools mm -hmm. to sort of convene on DC and learn and grow from one another. And so there's such power in one, the community that students create here, but to Dr. Smith's mm -hmm. point, the broader community that exists mm -hmm. around how do we ensure you, you will be successful, mm -hmm. not can be, but will be mm -hmm. successful, and how do we work with a partner who is also totally aligned around that vision, mission, and goal for our students to get them across the finish line. So I think, you know, we've probably all heard those mm -hmm. stories from our students of just what the difference it's made, um, and it is such an incredible opportunity to, again, meet our students where they are, and understand one size isn't gonna fit all, and we can have these different paths that, that cultivate their success. Thank you so much for your leadership and um, the lives that you are impacting and changing. We couldn't do this important work without leaders such as you. Thank you. And now it's time to hear from one of our amazing sponsors who's investing in better futures. Education is the key that you don't wanna lose. Thank you, Indianapolis, for your investment in better futures. The Next Generation Initiative started about five years ago with a clear vision of providing young people with an opportunity to get real world skills in media production so by the time they got ready to go into the workforce, they would be prepared. And uh, Duan had a great year for Ben Davis. Ben Davis was able to make the state championship game. You know, this, this, is, this is where my, my passion was sparked. <laughs> Welcome back to the Mick Network. If you're just tuning in, it's halftime here at Ben Davis High School. Of the participants that have been involved with the next generation, we know that of now we have over 50 former participants that are now actively working in the media production field. And our Next Generation Initiative allows us to enable the next generation of media professionals to be successful by providing them an opportunity to get hands-on experience and also to work alongside professionals to help them advance their careers. I definitely felt like going into college, I went to Ball State University. Um, because of the Next Generation Initiative, I felt like I had a, a leg up on some of my peers who, like I said, a lot of a lot of schools, a lot of programs in high school just don't offer these same opportunities. Our participants have been able to be involved with projects for the NCAA, HealthNet, and gosh, just a myriad of other uh, organizations. And again, the emphasis on giving them an opportunity to work with real professionals on real world projects. Being a 501c3 organization will allow us to expand our services, reach more young people, and ultimately invite other organizations to be a part of the success of the Next Generation Initiative. How do you begin to tell a story of over 16,000 students and 2,500 employees in 23 different buildings, each with their own backgrounds and talents and goals, and yet we're still one community. We're one big, inclusive, welcoming, respectful family. The incredible choices beginning in the early learning centers and continuing through high school create opportunities and pathways to graduation. We have a lot of opportunities and choices academically. We always try to give our students the upper hand. There's no doubt that test scores are important, but teaching our young people the value of cross-cultural collaboration, empathy, problem solving, and critical thinking, that's equally important. There are just so many different kinds of people that you can learn from and learn with. I am able to consider so many different perspectives. This district is never willing to settle. It's always looking for the best results. Every student, every day, this is our story. This is Lawrence Township. So thank you so much, Inna Power, for convening this conversation and for inviting me to participate today. My name is Stephanie Bothan, and I co-founded Ascend Indiana. Ascend is the Talent and Workforce Development Initiative of the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, or CICP. In an effort to advance a fair and more inclusive future for people of color, several organizations formed a new effort in 2020 called Business Equity for Indy, or BEI. 
BEI is a joint effort of the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, the Indy Chamber, in collaboration with the Indianapolis Urban League. And BEI stakeholders have a common goal, which is to grow a more inclusive business climate and build greater equity and economic opportunity for the Indy region's Black residents and people of color. One of BEI's first steps was to analyze Indiana's education to employment pipeline and disaggregate that by race and ethnicity. The report completed by the Learning and Talent Opportunities Task Force in 2021 found that Black and Hispanic Hoosiers face pronounced inequitable outcomes at every stage of the education and workforce development pipeline. Some of the sobering statistics included in Marion County, of the approximately 3,000 Black students who graduated high school in 2012-2013, just 442 graduated from an Indiana public post-secondary institution within six years with either a two- or four-year degree. Of the 595 Black Marion County high school graduates who graduated from one of Indiana's public post-secondary institutions in 2014 or 2015, only 296 remained in the workforce in Indiana five years later. College enrollment rates for Black high school graduates in Indiana plummeted by 12 percentage points over the last decade. For white high school graduates, while enrollment fell, it only fell by half as much, only six percentage points, meaning that the enrollment and the opportunity gap is widening in our city and in our state. Black students graduated from Indiana's put Indiana's public post-secondary institutions at about half the rate of our white students. And overall, these disparities contributed to a 15 percentage point gap in attainment, post-secondary attainment, between Black and white residents in Marion County. And why do we care about all of this? For a number of reasons, but when we look at wages, there's significant racial disparities in median wages as a result, with Black individuals earning nearly 20% less in median wages three years after graduating with a bachelor's degree. These, this is a crisis. It's been a crisis. It's even more so today at the forefront of conversation that we're hearing. As a result of the unequal system, Black individuals are far less likely to obtain a job with family-sustaining wages and to build the generational wealth that will turn the tides of previous system failures and racism. Employers struggle to fill knowledge and skill-based positions with the talent that they need. And overall, we don't have the thriving city that we could have and the good opportunities for lots of people. While no single person or institution is responsible for this inequality, employers are in a particularly strong position to impact this complex community-wide challenge. That's why today we have representation from a leading Indianapolis employer, Eli Lilly and Company. They will talk about how their companies view the role in addressing inequitable systems, skilled talent shortages, as well as some of the strategies that are promising and that are working. However, the magnitude of these disparities necessitates a multi-pronged approach to address the systems that create the inequity. So with us today, we're thrilled to have representation from Employee Indy, Indianapolis's Workforce Investment Board, and JP Morgan Chase. They will share more about their efforts at the practice and policy level to address these issues. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about who I, the organization I represent, Ascend Indiana. Ascend is also at the table for these discussions. We act as an intermediary to catalyze employer and education partnerships that address systemic barriers to equality for Hoosiers in our workforce, while also ensuring we're filling talent gaps and growing uh, opportunity for our employer community. We do that in three ways. The first is the Ascend Network, which is our job matching platform. We help job seekers find quality opportunities that match their interests and skills while supporting Indiana employers and in their efforts to identify and hire qualified candidates. Through Ascend Services, which is the team that I lead, we better connect employers and education throughout the state. We provide consulting and capacity to develop innovative strategies, partnerships, and pipelines that ensure our residents have the skills, access, and capital to obtain that good job. And part of this work <laughs> involves developing high quality career pathways for youth, such as the Modern Youth Apprenticeship uh, effort, which you will hear from our panelists today, alongside Chase's New Skills Ready Network. So we'll discuss both of these promising practices. And then finally, at Ascend, we recognize that programs alone are insufficient to address the needs that we have. So we capture in research and in reports what we're learning about why our system doesn't work the way it should, and then working to publish that back out to our community so we can address those shared priorities and work collectively towards them. 
So with that preamble, we have a lot to discuss with our panel today. I am thrilled to be here to moderate a discussion among the thoughtful and creative leaders that we have on our panel today. Joining us from Eli Lilly and Company is Julie Dunlap. Julie's the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer and Vice President of Talent Management. In her role, Julie has responsibility for all aspects of talent management, including recruiting, staffing, performance management, employee and leadership development with DEI fully integrated throughout. Julie has been at Lilly for over 20 years with expanding responsibilities in human resources and global strategic project leadership. Thanks for being here, Julie. To provide the workforce intermediary perspective, Jay Stiles joins us from Employee Indie. As the Senior Director of Business Partnerships, Jay is responsible for developing and implementing strategies that address and meet the needs of business in Indianapolis. She has more than 15 years of national workforce development experience. Jay is charged with leading a team of business development and account management professionals who assist Marion County employers in addressing their needs and accessing untapped diverse talent pools through our ecosystem of stakeholders and partners. And then finally, to shed light on the role of philanthropy in driving this program and systems change, we have Mambu Sherman from J.P. Morgan Chase, serving as the Vice President of Global Philanthropy. Mambu is responsible for directing the firm's philanthropic strategy across Indiana, Wisconsin, and Chicago markets with the goal to drive inclusive growth and greater economic opportunity in cities. His work includes supporting small business expansion for women and by POC entrepreneurs, investing in programs and innovative products that help people achieve greater financial stability, advancing holistic, locally driven solutions that help neighborhoods thrive, and supporting efforts that enhance career pathways and economic mobility. Thanks for being here. We have such an incredible panel and discussion for today. So I provided a few framing comments on the scale and the magnitude of the challenge that we face as a community. So to start us off, I wanna hear from our panel about why it's so important for business to focus in on cultivating black talent. For the employers, what are some of the key strategies and promising practices you're utilizing to develop talent, specifically cultivating black talent? So with that, Julie, I would love to hand the mic over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. And I appreciate being a part of this important conversation. At Lilly, diversity, equity, and inclusion has been a core piece of our organization. And not only is it the right thing to do, but we see it as a business imperative. We know that having diverse talent is critical to our innovation strategy, as well as being able to represent the diverse views and needs of the patients that we serve. So we've been on this journey and we've made progress, but we certainly have more work to do. Um, we have several programs targeted specifically at attracting and uh, developing diverse talent. But with respect specifically to black talent in 2020, after the murder of George Floyd, we made a series of commitments called our racial justice commitments. And part of that was pledging to increase the workforce representation of our black talent from approximately 10% to 13%. At the same time, we uh, joined a partnership called 110. So if you're not familiar, 110 is a coalition of companies across the US with a mission of providing, uh, hiring, promoting, advancing 1 million black Americans uh, over the course of the next 10 years. And the key piece to that is talent that does not have a four-year degree. So as part of that commitment, we've launched something at Lilly called Skills First. And we actually have three programs now running underneath that umbrella of Skills First. The first one is our professional apprenticeship program. And that is where we've taken jobs that traditionally would have a bachelor's degree requirement. We've taken that requirement off hired in individuals um, and put them through a 13 month apprenticeship program where they get on the job training and then with the goal of placing them in a permanent position in our organization. The second program is called our craft apprenticeship program and that's in our manufacturing organization. So we take individuals, um, put them through on the job training, but also at the same time partnering with Ivy Tech for them to get certifications or pursue their associate's degree 
and ultimately um, help them be qualified for some of our more technical roles in the manufacturing environment. And then our third one that we've launched most recently is in our IT organization. So again, looking at jobs and taking off the bachelor's degree requirement and instead replacing that with descriptions of skills, certifications, experiences we're looking for, um, we'll bring them into the organization, put them into a development program, uh, and then ultimately hire them into full-time positions. So we're, we're still new on the journey, but looking forward to continuing to expand Skills First into other parts of our organization. I'll just mention, in addition to Skills First, we certainly have other efforts targeted at partnerships with HBCUs, um, and as I mentioned, continuing to develop and elevate within our organization as well. Thanks for sharing that, Julie. And I think it really shows the sort of depth and breadth of the different mechanisms and ways, program models that you're thinking about. Um, and I think we wanna dive into some of those even a little bit more today. So excited to, to hear more about that. As we switch over to the intermediary perspective, want to invite Jay Styles into our conversation as well to talk a little bit about what she sees as why it's so important for our business to focus in on cultivating that black talent. And really, what are you seeing in terms of some of those key strategies? So Jay, I'd love to invite you in. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you, Julie. You know, Eli Lilly has been a, a great partner. Uh, an employer representative here in Marion County. So we appreciate your continued partnership and all the work that Eli Lilly does to, to uplift and create opportunity here in Marion County. Uh, but as the Workforce Development Board at Employee Indy, one of our primary goals is to actually address many of the systemic barriers that really prevent our residents of Marion County from accessing opportunity. And so it's pretty clear, you know, to us in terms of the why that many of our young black talent um, really lack the social capital to access many of the opportunities that, that we know exist. And then businesses don't always know how to make the connection to the talent. So we look at this from a couple different standpoints. We look at this and how we can address this from a programmatic lens in which we've created a couple of programs, um, most notably two that I'll reference are our Talent Bound program. Our Talent Bound program is really an employer engagement tool. We had employers coming to us and saying, we want to connect with schools. We want to connect with young people. We know that they are really the next generation of workers that we need to access, but we don't know how. We also don't have the resources or the capacity internally to manage all of those school relationships. And out of that need, the Talent Bound program was born, where we make it really easy and seamless for employers to work through us as an intermediary to facilitate those connections to the schools in a way that's meaningful to the business. And in return, we're helping to leverage and add capacity to those school partners by making it easier for the businesses to connect. And so we have multiple school partners throughout Marion County um, that we're able to leverage and actually facilitate those connections. And then additionally, we have what's called modern apprenticeship through our partners at Ascend, where we create apprenticeship opportunities for high school students starting in their junior year of high school. So what we do with those, uh, with those programs is those apprentices have opportunities to participate in high wage, high demand occupational pathways while earning income, earning credentials, accessing that social capital that we know has been elusive. And in our first cohort of 30 apprentices, 93% identified as students of color. So when we talk about leveraging and providing access to, to black and brown students, these are some powerful ways that we can leverage some of those resources. And then from a system standpoint, our partners at JP Morgan Chase, um, which Mambu will talk about a little bit further, um, actually we partner on what's new, called the New Skills Ready Network Initiative. And that program actually was designed to better prepare young people, especially Black and Latinx learners, prepare them for their future of work. 
And in our role as an intermediary, we convene educators from all levels, as well as employers to really create systems level change. Um, and with that, I know, you know, Mambu, you will talk about that a little bit further, but those are just a couple of the areas of how and why we actually believe that this is important at Employee Indy. Thanks for sharing that, Jay. And I, we are so fortunate to have an innovative, hands-on workforce board like Employee Indy in our backyard, you know, it, creating these systems, relationships, partnerships, um, and it's just very clear that they are so committed to figuring out how to make this work. So alongside an incredible employer in Lily, who's just really thinking outside the box, we're just really lucky to also have an intermediary that allows us to create that connectivity in a really meaningful way. And you can tell the sophistication of the thinking too around how do we change some of this. And so really excited to invite Mambu uh, Sherman also into the conversation to think about his why and also sort of the, the role of philanthropy. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, I want to first extend our gratitude on behalf of J.P. Morgan Chase and the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation to NL Power and this amazing conference team for inviting us to share about our work. A few ideas we're exploring around workforce development. Um, I'm going to share from a from a personal perspective, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about our work at J.P. Morgan Chase. Um, so I, I grew up in Norcross, Georgia, just 20, 30 minutes north of Atlanta. And I got a job running a high school based youth program after college. Ironically, the job was at the high school where I graduated from. Um, this high school has a special place in my heart for several reasons. Not only is it my alma mater, um, it's where I met my first real girlfriend who would become my first wife, my, my only wife. <laughs> um, this place was also where I would come into a, a, a deepened understanding of the work I've committed my career to. Quick context for this school. The, uh, the county's school system is one of the largest in the country. This one high school has over 2,000 students. The school's name was Meadow Creek. Back in the day, its moniker was Ghetto Creek. Not because it was an underperforming school or bad, or, or even dangerous for that matter. In fact, it was none of those things. It was called Ghetto Creek simply because the school had a majority black and Latinx student population in a county that was mostly white. And I remember working in the school and seeing uh, bright eyed freshmen come in every year and watching so many young people who I had built relationships with not make it across the finish line to graduation. Students fell through the cracks for a myriad of different reasons. I remember we always had students in our home, and at times sleeping on our couches. I have 24 and 25 year old adults who still refer to Jennifer, my wife, as Mama Jen. But what I wrestle with um, is the reality that those same 24 and 25 year olds struggle to navigate a post secondary system that, quite frankly, wasn't designed for them. And those 24 and 25 year olds still struggled to navigate a workforce system that again, wasn't designed for them. And I'll talk more about what I mean by systems not being designed for students later on. Um, when I transitioned from that role and started doing youth programming and organizing on the South and West sides of Atlanta, I saw a very similar challenge in Atlanta public schools. And when I moved to Chicago, there it was again. And as we look at what's happening even here in Indy, it's a story and reality that I, and I think the folks on this call are all too familiar with. It causes us to take a step back and, and really think about um, what we're doing, and how we're solving problems. There's a really interesting quote by Tim Brown. Uh, Tim Brown's the, the chairman and former CEO of IDEO. Um, where he says, we're at a, a critical point where rapid change is forcing us to, to look not just at new ways of solving problems, but to look at new problems to solve. Almost a, a, a reframing and looking at problems from a, a different lens. And that's the why and that's the orientation around the work that causes us to think about systems change through a new light, think about innovation, in philanthropy and innovation in direct service programming. 
uh, that has really led to our new skills ready network initiative. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. I love that quote. And it's, you know, not just thinking about how do we build within an existing system, but it's questioning the entire system and thinking about a redesign or a re-envisioning of what's possible and what's needed. And I think that's a really exciting charge for us as we talk together on this panel, but also as we engage others in our community on this issue. I do want to go a, maybe a little bit deeper here as we kind of talk more about what it's going to take. Um, as you know, Julie, you mentioned lots of different efforts over lots of years that Eli Lilly has been pushing into and innovating and trying and testing. So I'm curious, as you all worked to implement those programs, one, can you talk a little bit about the barriers that you faced or continue to face as you are designing those different structures and how you overcame them? And then second to that, I'd love for you also to reflect on what value are you seeing from those programs, from that testing, from that innovation to try to create different outcomes on behalf of individuals and for Eli Lilly as a whole? Sure, I'd be happy to share. Um, certainly, as you mentioned, we're, we're still learning. So we're learning and iterating and improving as we go. But um, a challenge in a, that we experience is really currently with the talent funnel. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a labor shortage. And then you put on top of that some of the statistics that you shared earlier, Stephanie, about um, the eligible populations. And we're really trying to figure out how do we source talent in a different way that we haven't done traditionally in the past? How do we identify that? And of course, the key piece of that is developing partnerships, right? Partnerships within the community, with organizations like yours, um, as well as educational institutions. Um, I'd say the other thing, maybe not a challenge, but a learning is with some of the talent that we've brought in for apprenticeship programs is figuring out what kinds of additional support and wraparound services will be important to help ensure their success. So we're looking at things like helping connect them to high quality childcare. In some cases, there's transportation needs, mentorship, on the job training, and continuing to evolve what that looks like as well. And then I think just uh, getting the word out that Lily is hiring a, a wide variety of different skill sets. I think many people think of Lilly and think of people with scientific degrees. Um, and actually we have a broad spectrum of different types of jobs and now also highlighting many jobs that don't require a four-year degree. Um, in terms of benefits, I think we've seen some positive impact already with our programs, uh, the diverse experiences and perspectives that these individuals are bringing to our organization and impacting the groups in which they work has been very positive. Um, in fact, I'd share, we have, we've had a couple of apprentices in my learning and development organization, and one of them that just finished their uh, apprenticeship and converted to a full-time learning and development professional, she's actually helping us on the training and curriculum for our next round of apprentices based upon her experience and learning going through the program, how we can continue to improve it. Thank you for those really thoughtful um, comments. I think what comes to mind for me is the promise of partnership here that we've been talking about, the promise of bringing those impacted by these systems together and helping them, you know, as Julie was talking about, to co-design new ideas for addressing some of these inequities or something like the new skills ready network where we're not just going to build a program we're going to bring these partners together and ask them why five times for every policy or every barrier that we run up against that's the work and that's what it's going to take if we're going to start making real progress against the data that we have been talking about throughout this conversation I think our charge to you, if you're watching, uh, this may seem like, wow, it's incredibly complex. There's so much work to do, but we cannot sit back on our heels and wait. We need you to act. If you're a business, if you are not sure where to start, reach out to Jay, reach out to me. Let's get going on figuring out how we can support you. If you are a parent or a student or somebody who is engaging in our system, get connected to your school, get connected to Employee Indie. There are lots of opportunities out there 
for you. And if you are someone who has a role or power in this system, you have policy at your you know, disposal or resourcing, please get involved and connected with the work that's happening. There's so much opportunity, I think, in front of us. And you've heard the power of that from this group today. I just want to say a, a huge thank you to this incredible panel. What a dynamic conversation about where we are and the challenges of that and really uh, thought provoking ideas on where we need to go. And I hope that in a year or two with Inner Power, we'll be bringing some of these folks back and talking about how we have realized some of those opportunities that we are talking about today. Also to Inapower, what an incredible platform you have created to cultivate these conversations. Thank you for having Ascend and this entire team here to have this conversation. Finally, if you want to get connected, all the panelists have offered up their email information. Please reach out to us. We would love to continue the conversation. It certainly should not stop here. And the final thing I want to say is, um, you know, there's a quote that I heard from a friend uh, in another state that really, I think, sums up a lot of what we're talking about today. It's by Margaret Mead, and it's never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So my charge is let's be that small group and let's get bigger and larger. I was amazed at this work-based program that offers the opportunity to be in the field while also learning about it as a 16-year-old, honestly, that is very amazing. You get experience on the hand job learning. I think the biggest benefit is that it allows me to take a bigger step into the healthcare field, which is something I've always been interested in since I was young. I've always wanted to help other people learn how to take care of others. It's been a big part of my personality, and I think here in the MAP program, it allows me to grow towards that pathway. I was interested in the MAP program because it's um, HVAC, something I actually want to do later in life. It's actually like a great pathway, so it was a great opportunity for me to take it. This um, program actually opened up a pathway to ride towards the main maintenance technician for HVAC. So this is a great pathway for me to take. I work at Ascend Indiana, and as a project coordinator, I work a lot with like project execution and organization. Helping with the second cohort of MAP has been a cool experience. I've been doing a lot with pitching to employers, helping with the materials there, and recently I've been working in the design process. Corporate work experience at like 16 years old, you don't really see that anywhere. And like um, a good starting wage is like, I get paid $13.50 an hour. So that's, that's pretty good for a teenager. What most jobs ask you for is, do you have experience doing this? How much experience you have? But somebody fresh out of college wouldn't have that experience. So I feel like in this, this program solves that problem in a unique way. There's not a lot of high school students who could say, oh, I worked in a corporate setting. But I could say that because I worked with the MAP program. It seems like it's a win-win, honestly. There's no cons to it. I can't think of a con to it. There's literally nothing to lose. You get a paycheck, you get work experience. It's not even up for debate. Do it. Good morning and welcome to the 2022 NO Power Minority Business Conference. My name is Daryl Lockett. I'm the executive director of the Kennedy King Memorial Initiative. The Kennedy King Memorial Initiative builds upon the historic events of April 4th, 1968, and the inextricable link that the city of Indianapolis plays within the life and legacy of Senator Robert Francis Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. For it was on that evening, the evening that Dr. King was assassinated, Senator Kennedy left Indianapolis with words of peace, understanding, empathy, compassion, and love in a time when violence had shaken us at our core. Those words are still true and ring true today in Indianapolis and all across the country. But today I am joined with two higher education leaders here in the city about how we can engage and prepare black students to compete and thrive in the coming years and the next generation here in Indianapolis. I'm joined with Dr. Lorenzo Esters, uh, the Chancellor of Ivy Tech Community College Indy, and Dr. Sean Huddleston, CEO of Martin University. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for, Thank for you. having us. 
Well, Dr. Huddleston, can you please start us out and just tell us a little bit about your background and what brings you to the table here today? Sure, sure. So I'm what's considered to be, I guess, a non-traditional college president. I did not come up through the academic ranks. It's, in fact, probably about half of my career was in corporate America. The mm -hmm. thing that kind of links uh, both my higher education experience and my corporate experience is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. It's work that I've always done. So prior to joining Martin University about three and a half years ago, um, I was the inaugural chief diversity officer for the University of Indianapolis, mm -hmm. and then before that for Framingham State University, and then did some work with Grand Valley State University in the same place. But prior to that, I was in uh, diversity and inclusion in the automotive industry, in, in nonprofit, and some other things as well. So um, it just kind of culminates uh, this, this effort to just try to make sure that people who have been underserved, underprivileged, and underestimated, mm -hmm. prevent them with opportunities to succeed. Definitely. Dr. Esters? I think we actually have similar background. We're both non-traditionalists. So my background uh, has been in college access. I worked for higher education associations. Uh, moved to Indianapolis in 2024, I'm sorry, 2014, to work for what is now Stride Education Network. So I was primarily supporting uh, access to education, success in higher education, and workforce development. Um, worked in K-12 in terms of U.S. Department of Education. So the ability to bring all that experience working in K-12 policy, higher education advocacy, and my student success and enrollment management experience as the Vice President for Student Affairs at Kentucky State University. Wonderful uh, place to be, enjoying my time in Indianapolis, and uh, very pleased to be here. Well, definitely, gentlemen, in the past two years, we've experienced quite a bit. Um, as a community, as a city, as a nation, um, and the black community specifically as, uh, in, in, for this conversation. But there's been a greater acknowledgement of systemic racism and the challenges that have resulted and that we still grapple with today. Your universities tackle these issues head on on a daily basis because I, I think you guys will both say um, overcoming some of these challenges is critical mm -hmm. for the next generation of leadership within the African American community and within this nation. Can you just add a, a little bit more about what your institutions are doing to create these environments for African American students, and, and I was going to say youth, but students of all ages, sure. to truly thrive in this in this landscape? Yeah. So I'll, I'll serve you on sure. mine. So Martin University was founded in 1977 by Father Boniface Harton, who was a Benedictine monk. In fact, one of only two black Benedictine monks ever in the United States who became a civil rights activist. In fact, our school is named after Martin Luther King. Uh, and so his thought was that we needed to try to address this first generation phenomenon that was impacting African American and low income students where they were going to colleges and boomeranging back because there was really no one else in the family or the community who had had a college experience or was successful in college. Mm -hmm. So the idea was that if we can tackle the first generation, then the second generation coming through would have this college-going culture amongst them, mm -hmm. right? And he specifically targeted those areas, again, where folks have been underrepresented, underserved, and certainly um, underestimated in their opportunities. Mm -hmm. So our school has always been built around this idea that we really need to find our ways to wrap around each other for our collective success and growth and moving our pathways forward. So Martin University, um, which is located in Martin Del Brightwood, 46218 area code, which is one of the, some would call one of the most economically disadvantaged areas in the city, but I think it's one that's been uh, marginalized and there's tremendous opportunity for growth and development. So we are there intentionally to be able to serve and support, but to also be able to show where excellence can emanate from. Mm, definitely, definitely. Dr. Esther, how would you say, you know, community colleges are really meeting the needs of, of young people today? Sure. So Ivy Tech Indianapolis is the largest of the 19 community college campuses in the state. We have one of the most diverse multi multicultural uh, campuses and student populations within the state. About 30,000 students we serve annually. About 28% uh, of those students are African American students. 6% uh, are Latino. That presents tremendous opportunity for us as a campus. Our vision is to be the campus without walls. The campus without walls for us means that we're being bold in identifying the challenges that our community is facing. We're being intentional and inclusive with how we collaborate with the community, whether it's faith-based organizations, community-based organizations, K-12 schools, 
to build diverse pathways to degrees and credentials. And we're being generating in terms of what are the innovative solutions that we need to develop in partnership with our community, in partnership with Martin University and other four-year institutions to be responsive to the needs of our community. So for us, uh, it really is creating a sense of belonging for students, uh, regardless of race, um, and that's what we've been focused on. So how do we build diverse pathways to degrees and credentials, and how do we ensure that students have the support system they need once they arrive at our door? Definitely, and one word you, you hit on that I want to kind of dig deeper into is innovative. Sure. As we are preparing for the jobs of the future, how important is it that we are you know, building the skills and the credentials that are needed to be competitive for those high wage positions? It's absolutely important, and I, our president, President Sue Elsperman, has challenged us uh, to ensure that we uh, award 50,000 credentials per year. And as the largest campus, Indianapolis certainly has to do its part. Um, we produce about 6,000 completions per year. And what, what is important for us is that we partner with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations to get individuals into these high-wage, high-demand uh, professions. There are a number of professions. So often students think they have to have a degree, if you will, but other opportunities in terms of credentials and certifications that can be stackable, that lead to associate's degrees and to bachelor's degrees. Um, so our, our goal is putting students on a path uh, to be successful, whether it is starting with a credential, then to an associate's degree, and then transferring to a four-year institution, ensuring they have the, the framework they need uh, to build. When you said the framework they need, I've heard a lot about a new framework that Martin has, has sort of blown out of the water and has taken Indianapolis by storm. Can you tell me a little bit about the Martin Works initiative? Absolutely. So Martin Works is essentially Martin's work to a career program. Uh, it's modeled after Paul Quinn's Urban Work College. Uh, we will be the first and only urban work college in the, in the state of Indiana. Uh, and one of the few in the country that focuses on the non-traditional or adult student. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we established the position because, or the program, because people come to Martin University because they need a pathway to something else that will change their lives. And we want to make sure we're delivering on that promise. And so we've partnered with some of the largest employers in the state to be able to offer imprint apprenticeships to our students so that they actually begin their journey to their career before they even finish their degree. Mm. So uh, it's a two-year assignment. They get an opportunity to get connected well, to understand the culture of the organizations, and really understand what it means to work in the profession that they're studying. And then when they graduate, we hope that they walk across that stage with a college degree and an offer letter. Now, you mentioned partnerships on both sides. What is the relationship between partnership and retention that you've seen as, as individuals who are overcoming some challenges and barriers seek to matriculate to whether it's a two-year degree, a certificate, just credentials, or even a four-year degree? What, what's the, the need for partnership, and what have some of these innovative partnerships look like? Yeah, I say for us, um, partnership has a lot of benefits. One of the most significant benefits for us, if we're talking about an employer landscape, is that it helps us best understand what the learning outcomes need to be for our students. We all know if you pick up a textbook, most of the information is two to three years outdated anyway. Mm -hmm. We need to know what, is, what do people need to know to be successful on the job today and tomorrow. And also, how do we not just create good employees, but good employers? How do we build mm -hmm. entrepreneurship and opportunities for uh, our community to be able to build upon uh, uh, economic landscape that makes an opportunity for everybody to be successful. So for us, partnership is the opportunity for us to, to, uh, to have collective impact, mm -hmm. to be able to bring strengths from both organizations or both institutions together so that we can help uh, people to rise and shine. I think our partnership with Ivy Tech is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of strength in uh, Ivy Tech Indianapolis and the entire uh, system of 19 campuses that Martin University can be benefit, from, benefit from. Vice versa, I think because we're a little bit smaller and more nimble, we're able to try things that um, uh, we can have learnings from and certainly help Ivy Tech as well. So there's a lot of different ways that we just bring this, uh, our strengths together so that everyone can be strong. And for us, I think it's about ecosystem. So partnership through the ecosystem. So how do we build effective pathways for students? Um, when I say ecosystem, K-12 school system, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, and four-year institutions. And obviously, employers have to also be a key component of that ecosystem. So for us, it is reaching down into K-12. How do we ensure that students are acclimated to college long before they actually show up at our door? Um, so that they have a college-going culture, if you will. Uh, 
that's particularly important for students who are first generation students, as I was, uh, first generation college attendee. So I know the empowering impact that a degree has, not just on the life of the degree earner, but those who come behind that uh, degree earner. Uh, so the opportunity for us is to partner with K-12 to ensure we are uh, providing credentials even while students are still in high school. Mm -hmm. um, partnering with employers for those who are seeking to reskill or upskill. How do we ensure that employers have the opportunity to actually support that reskill or upskilling for employees? So we have several good examples of how we're doing that with employers like the Indianapolis International Airport or One America and several others uh, within, the, within the state and within our service area. Obviously with Martin University, how do we ensure that we build partnerships with Martin where students can actually be acclimated to Martin while they're still a student at Ivy Tech? So that it becomes a seamless transfer, if you will, creating a presence for Martin on our campus as we're doing with other four-year institutions within our service area. One thing I heard you, you guys both mention were employers. And I heard Dr. Huddleston, you said, to make good employers. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the center. This is a new center at, at Martin University that yes. I've heard a lot that I know that's also working with the corporate community to make uh, a better climate for, for in individuals to rise and succeed in their, in their work. Yeah, we were so pleased about a year ago to launch the Martin University National Center for Racial Equity and Inclusion. And we really call it national on purpose because we expect to be a beacon for every other organization that wants to do it right. The truth of the matter is that we get a lot of black people who land in major uh, employers and major corporations and they get stuck. So we want to help employers understand how to embed sustainable diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives so that when black employees do land in their places, wherever they come, there is an opportunity for career trajectory. So we want to make sure it's truly, truly inclusive. So we do that through uh, training, through consulting, and through other measures to help them truly be successful in that space. But by the same token, we also want to make sure that uh, entrepreneurship is something that we're thinking about as communities. And so we want to help to cultivate entrepreneurs who can also become good employers as well. Now, I'm, I'm sitting with you gentlemen, and I, I was just looking in the news just recently and saw that you guys were standing with One America uh, not too long ago yeah. uh, talking about the wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And I've, it's been said that we cannot close the wealth gap here in Indianapolis without the institutions of Ivy Tech, without Martin University. Can you guys elaborate a little bit more about that? I think it's, it's understood that education and training is key to putting individuals on a path to wealth and to being uh, self-sustainable for themselves and for their families. Uh, we know that uh, Ivy Tech, our goal is to help individuals by find and um, begin high-wage, high-demand employment. And um, for us, we know that students who earn an associate's degree at Ivy Tech earn about $440,000 more over their lifetime, lifetime than an individual who does not have an associate's degree, particularly a student who only has a high school uh, diploma. So for us, it is about ensuring that individuals have pathways out of poverty, if you will, uh, and uh, putting them on the path to wealth. What would a win look like for you guys in the next five years. And, and I know you guys work together on a lot of things, yeah. but separately you guys lead two different institutions. So what would a win look like for Martin University in the next five years? So in five years, Martin will celebrate its 50th anniversary. So it's a big year for us. We just launched our, our five-year strategic plan. Uh, but here's one of the things that I think is critically important. I think I would recognize it as a win. This year, in fact, uh, on Saturday, we had our commencement. And uh, this year's graduating class received something called the Legacy Scholarship. And simply what it is, it's a scholarship that you take and give to someone else mm. who is from your village, right? A family member, a close friend, someone in your community who you know will benefit from receiving a college education and ultimately a degree. So we gave $1,000 scholarships, legacy scholarships mm -hmm. to every graduate this year, and we'll continue to do that. So a win for me is that we continue to offer those scholarships and people take advantage of those scholarships so that we have more people achieving their goals, their hopes, their dreams, moving out of poverty and into wealth through education. Mm -hmm. So I talked earlier about being the campus without walls. In five years for us, we want to ensure that we have demonstrated what it means to be the campus without walls. And there are two frameworks, I think, that will support that. One is education by design. How are we building those pathways that I've talked about here with K-12, with faith-based, community-based organizations, employers, so that individuals have on-ramps, if you will, to a degree or credential. 
And as a result of those partnerships, we will see more uh, individuals who have attained those degrees and credentials, and we ha will address equity gaps. Equity gaps in terms of the number of African Americans, the number of Latino, number, number of women who are actually earning those degrees uh, at Ivy Tech. Uh, the other component has to be the number of students who are transferring to four-year institutions like Martin University and other four-year institutions. And the second framework is success by design. We will have developed a culture and a sense of support for students that ensures that they have what they need, whether we're talking about wraparound services, uh, students who are in need of, who have food insecurity issues. Uh, how are we partnering with our community-based organization to support those students? Because we have to support the whole student, right? Not just what happens within the classroom, but what that student needs to outside of the classroom, whether we're talking food issues or food secure insecurity or housing issues, et cetera. So in five years, we will be known as the campus that has lived up to that vision to be the campus without walls. And we will demonstrate that through the number of students who are completing those degrees and credentials, and particularly the number of students of color who are doing so. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. The whole city, I tell you, just on behalf of NO Power, but Indianapolis is in your corner and wants to see you guys succeed and be most successful in the job that you're doing because ultimately you are strengthening Indianapolis. So thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the conference. And here's a message from our sponsors. Allies make statements, accomplices take action. Indie Accompliceship is all about bringing metrics and accountability to your corporate social responsibility. Indie Accompliceship is a four-part pledge focused on the workplace, the workforce, the marketplace, and the community. When you think about the employees you already have in your environment, how are you treating them? How many black employees do you have in director level or higher? When you think about the workplace, how are you attracting and retaining new talent? How many black people are serving on your boards? When you think about the marketplace, how much is your supplier diversity spending with black businesses and how easy is it for them to work with you? And when you think about the community, what are you doing beyond cutting checks? That's what Indie Accompliceship is. How do we work together to make sure that there's a good head, heart and hands campaign for your corporate responsibility and diversity and inclusion strategies?